I'll be honest, there's not much to say about this match. Part of the beauty of it is that it is instantly accessible to anyone who chooses to watch it. There's a very low barrier of entry for anyone trying to get into this match as the story is instantly apparent. Kobashi and Kikuchi are part of Misawa's Super Generation Army stable and have been tagging together while Misawa and Kawada act as the primary tag duo from the group. With Misawa and Kawada mostly preoccupied with the World Tag Team Championships, Kobashi and Kikuchi come after the All Asia Tag Team Championships instead. The All Asia Tag Titles are currently being held by Dan Crawford and Doug Furness a gaijin duo known as the Can american Express. While still hard-hitting in their own right, Crawford and Furness bring a little bit of the junior heavyweight flair to their offense, which allows them to tie up well with Kikuchi. While Kobashi has wrestled both Furness and Crawford on and off in singles action, perhaps the only real detail that you need to know about this match is that it's being contested in Kikuchi's hometown of Sendai. Everything else is apparent. The brash Gaijin duo champions against the much-beloved native workers. As soon as Crawford gestures at the belts, saying that Kobashi and Kikuchi have no chance, the story is already set for fans new and old coming to this match. The match follows the standard three-act structure of a tag team encounter. Kikuchi kicks things off on the right foot by swinging with some huge elbows that get the babyface shine going in the perfect manner to get the crowd raving. Although the heels do get in a few shots here and there, the first 10 minutes are pretty easily dominated by Kobashi and Kikuchi. While Kobashi has his fans as the big brother figure to Kikuchi here, it's pretty clear early on who the hero of the night is. When it comes to Kikuchi, the hometown crowd is absolutely roaring for every piece of offense that he has to throw. The only brief moments that this segment drags comes from the heel's early attempts at offense that don't garner much reaction or heat at all, but that's immediately contrasted with the rapturous response for the babyfaces. The match does take a turn, however, for a heel heat segment. A concentrated attack from the heels allows Furness to thrash around Kikuchi with his power. This marks an uptick in aggression from the heels, whose offense suddenly comes off far more menacing and threatening than it did during the shine. Kikuchi's flexibility makes him the perfect face in peril as Crawford and Furness take turns just stretching him out and ragdolling him in the ring. The match makes its final turn when Kikuchi finally makes the hot tag to Kobashi. Kobashi's expressive babyface fire makes for the perfect hot tag segment as he tears through the heels with his offense. It's at this point that the focus of the match shifts over to Kobashi. Although Kikuchi makes a final run in the ring with some close calls, Kikuchi's only trying to hold on long enough for Kobashi to get the chance to come back into the ring and finish the job. The finishing stretch is some of the hottest and most exciting wrestling you'll ever see, with multiple sequences and spots holding up to a modern standard even now. Kobashi finally secures the win with the moonsault off the top rope, earning him and the hometown boy the All-Asia Tag Team Championships. Now. 
Before I give my rating on this match, I want to take the time to discuss a question that this has put into my mind. It's a question that's only gotten even more relevant in 2020 than it's ever been in the history of pro wrestling. How important is the live crowd to the quality of a match? I don't know if you guys noticed, but 2020 sucks. We live in the midst of a global pandemic that has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives internationally in just a few short months. It has shaken the very foundations of our existence, exposing the worst aspects of state and society, and changed the way that we all live our lives and interact with the world. The coronavirus pandemic has forced us to question our relationship with nearly every aspect of human living, from topics as broad and overwhelming as the necessity for states to protect their peoples in a time of crisis, to the more internal and personal matters of individual mental health in a time of great distress and increasing isolation. Somehow, amidst all of that, via a combination of major political bribery and brazen disregard for worker safety, pro wrestling events have continued to come out during the pandemic. A Florida declaration naming pro wrestling as an essential service has laid precedent for the two biggest pro wrestling companies in North America to continue putting on shows. In other parts of the world, such as Japan and Mexico, moves to produce pro wrestling have continued as well, with each of these events having a simple common thread. No fans are allowed in attendance. These empty arena shows have highlighted just how much of wrestling's presentation hinges upon being performed in front of a live audience. It also exposes how intrinsic the responses of a live crowd are to the actual performance of pro wrestling. Just based on my own anecdotal observations, it's pretty clear that most wrestlers on TV right now have been so conditioned to be working within a TV setting surrounded by a large crowd that their inability to adapt to the new extraordinary circumstances are exposed. Why bother doing the same old entrance routine for only yourself and no one else? Why lay on the mat awaiting the rejuvenating applause of an audience that isn't there? Very few individual workers have been able to handle the transition well, as so much of the spectacle of wrestling lies in drawing emotion from the live audience. When you're left with just the fundamental ability to actually wrestle in the ring, Few talents can rise to the challenge. Of the workers currently on television right now, I'd probably say that people like Kenny Omega, Drew Gulak, and Daniel Bryan have handled those challenges the best. The absence has been so jarring that companies and workers all over the world have been forced to take various different measures to compensate for the change. AEW and recently WWE do so by populating the front rows with workers to cheer during matches and create the illusion of organic reactions from an audience. There's just enough people present to comfort your brain enough to accept the sight of two people trading simulated combat in the ring. The turn to that incredibly nebulous term Cinematic wrestling has also arisen from the need to shift away from a live medium. It's a shift closely linked to the ironic humor that many have found in wrestling at this time. Without a crowd, the entire performance is often laid bare for its true absurdity. And one way to compensate for that is to lean in fully and take that absurdity to its extremes. The COVID era has been difficult for me personally as a critic as I'm constantly grappling with the fact that many of these matches would be better simply if they had a crowd present to hide the flaws that become much clearer when played to silence. They'd also be better if they weren't morally reprehensible by virtue of simply existing, but that's a different story for another time. What wrestling in 2020 has highlighted for me much clearer than ever is that the live crowd reaction weighs far heavier on my opinion of a match than I'd originally thought. 
It's especially necessary for matches predicated on dramatic moments of selling, firing up, and emotional stakes. Sometimes a match gets carried on pure name value alone as a crowd invests in a personality with very little to do with what happens in the ring. And unfortunately, because of how American wrestling focuses on weekly television and spectacle, that's the style of match that we get more often than not. Ignoring the problem only makes it worse, and the bandage solutions that promotions are implementing do very little to properly compensate for that lack. And ignoring that problem as a critic is just as problematic. The lack of a crowd is just yet another limitation that workers now need to find the creativity to overcome. And if they can't, that's on them. An interesting thought experiment that holds no real value outside of my own incessant need to constantly consider the aesthetics of pro wrestling is to wonder how I would feel about this tag match if it was wrestled in COVID era 2020, before an empty arena. Is a classic match still a classic match without a crowd behind it? The answer is not necessarily. I mean, the action that these four men display does hold up and the structure is sound and compact, but outside of that, what's particularly transcendent about what these four do in the ring? Not too much outside of some sequences that are probably ahead of their time. This match exists on the exact opposite of the spectrum to most COVID-era pro wrestling in that it has a crowd so fully and deeply invested in the performers without a trace of irony or cynicism that it actively elevates everything happening in the ring. There's more weight to a leg lariat from Kikuchi when fans leap up out of their seats to cheer it. There's more indignation at Kanam's cutting off of Kobashi when it's accompanied by a torrent of booze. Even the strange focal shift from Kikuchi as the hometown hero to Kobashi as the conquering babyface gets massaged a bit by the fact that those powerful Kikuchi chants at the start of the match eventually turn into Kobashi chants by the finishing stretch. It's a great match turned into a beloved classic by the fans in attendance. There's really not much you can fault this match for. I'd probably still quibble about Kobashi getting the fall, but that is a singular blemish on something so simple and so effective. Of course we should celebrate a wrestling match that drew in a crowd so thoroughly that they've developed a reputation all of their own all these years later. In a time where we're deprived of something we consider so essentially part of the genre that we love, why shouldn't we celebrate such a thing? This match borders on perfection, but if you're going to play to a hometown crowd, why not go all the way? Let Kikuchi get the pin, and this soars into the five-star realm without problem. But outside of that, it's a simple, effective match that plays everything to perfection as the performers take advantage of the insane connection that each of them had to the audience in attendance that night. It is a classic tag match and an easy watch all these years later. It's 22 minutes that breezes by like nothing. I highly recommend it. Four and three quarter stars for me. Thank you everybody for tuning in to watch this video. Of course, I want to send a big shout out to my supporters on Kofi who helped make this possible. I want to say thank you to Chris Drakar, Jamie Sessions, and Matt. And to my monthly Kofi contributors in Eddie Roberts, Jake Dieterich, Captain Jack Heartless, and James Draper. You guys are absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for supporting me in this way. If you guys want to do the same to get early access to every video that I put out, check me out on Kofi.com slash Joseph Montesilio. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Don't forget to stay home, flatten the curve, and help those who can't help themselves. You guys are wonderful. Thank you, and have a good one.